Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Onto, Onto Innovation Third Quarter Earnings Release Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Sydney Ho. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Onto Innovation issued its 2024 third quarter financial results this afternoon, shortly after the market close. If you did not receive a copy of the release, please refer to the company's website where a copy of the release is posted. Joining us on the call today are Michael Placinski, Chief Executive Officer, and Mark Slicer, Chief Financial Officer. I'd like to remind you that the statements made by management on this call will contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. Those statements are subject to a range of changes, risks, and uncertainties that can cause actual results to vary materially. For more information regarding the risk factors that may impact onto innovation's results, I would encourage you to review our earnings release and our SEC filings. Onto innovation does not undertake the obligation to update these forward-looking statements in light of new information or future events. Today's discussion of our financial results will be presented on a non-GAAP financial basis unless otherwise specified. As a reminder, a detailed reconciliation between GAAP and non-GAAP results can be found in today's earnings release. Let me now turn the call over to our CEO, Mike Lasinski. Mike? Thank you, Sydney. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Overall, we executed well in the third quarter with revenue coming in at $252 million and setting a new quarterly record for inspection. In fact, we're on pace to nearly double our inspection revenue this calendar year. We also improved our gross margin to 54.5% and operating margin to 28%. This resulted in record cash generation from operations of $67 million. Mark will soon discuss these highlights and our outlook for Q4, which was negatively impacted by over 10 million in jet step lithography pushouts due to customers' capacity needs. But first, we'll review the third quarter highlights, starting with our specialty device and advanced packaging markets, where AI packaging revenue led the inspection business with growth in high bandwidth memory, offsetting a little less than projected decline in 2.5D logic packaging. Looking ahead, we expect to see increases in volume for logic packaging, as well as an increase in capital intensity for process control to address the growing complexity and need for higher process yields. This includes new demand for our front-end metrology systems, particularly for films and acoustic metrology. In fact, advanced packaging was one of the largest markets for our metrology business this quarter. Revenue from power devices was the second largest market and also set a quarterly record. Growth came from both metrology and inspection process control systems. Our power semiconductor customers continue to focus on driving yield improvements, especially with challenges associated with transitioning to larger wafer sizes, even as end demand remains temporarily muted. We expect this focus on yield to continue into next year and at least sustain this record level of revenue. Inspection has clearly been a strong driver for us, and we're expanding our core inspection technology with the tuck-in of Lumina Instruments announced earlier today. Lumina is a small company with a very rich background in laser-based inspection technologies used in unpatterned wafer and emerging panel applications. Their patented technology will allow us to simultaneously scan top, bottom, and subsurfaces with sensitivities sensitivities below 100 nanometers for silicon carbide and gallium nitride applications. We believe this technology will also be important for inspection of glass substrates and carriers used in 2.5D and 3D advanced packages where detecting surface defects buried inclusion defects, and residues on the silicon or glass core are important to yield. This new capability is complementary to our patterned inspection technologies with no overlap in capability. And as a result, we expect the new applications will expand our SAM by $250 million annually in the next three years. In addition to Lumina Instruments, we announced the acquisition of the lithography business from Kulik & Sofa. With this tuck-in, we add an incredibly talented team with over 200 man years of lithography experience, 24 issued patents, and eight more pending. 
based in Eindhoven, we believe this team and technology will contribute to the acceleration of our jet step lithography roadmaps and extend our competitive differentiation. We expect the combination of these two small tuck-ins to be accretive to earnings within 12 months and generate up to $100 million in annual revenue in the next three years. For reference, revenue today is negligible. While we strengthen our opportunities in the specialty and advanced packaging markets, we also see recovery from the advanced nodes. As expected, we saw growth in Logic, DRAM, and NAND in the quarter. In addition to our strong position in OCD metrology for these markets, we're seeing solid traction with our film metrology. This year, we're on pace to grow films metrology by over 50% versus 2023. Now, I'll turn the call over to Mark to review our financial highlights and provide fourth, fourth quarter guidance. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. As Mike highlighted, we exceeded the midpoint of our revenue and EPS guidance, executing towards the high end of these ranges due to better than expected demand for advanced packaging for AI devices, gate all around investments in advanced nodes, and stronger software and services within the quarter. We achieved another record operating cash flow of 67 million for the second straight quarter. Operating cash flow yield at 27% represents more than doubling of operating cash during the same period last year. Third quarter revenue of 252 million was up 4% versus the second quarter, and up 22% versus the prior year. The third quarter EPS increased 2% sequentially to $1.34 and up 40% versus the prior year. Looking at the quarterly revenue by markets, our biggest market remains specialty devices and advanced packaging, which was down slightly from Q2 with quarterly revenue of $161 million and represents 64% of revenue. Our biggest sequential increase was advanced nodes, which had revenue of $42 million, increased 32% over Q2 and represents 17% of revenue. Software and services with revenue of $49 million increased 5% over Q2, representing 19% of revenue. We achieved 55% gross margin for the third quarter at the high end of our guidance range of 53 to 55%, driving more than 100 basis point improvement over the second quarter and over 300 basis point improvement since the beginning of the year. Third quarter operating expenses were $67 million, exceeding the high end of our guidance range as we accelerated our ramp in R&D investments within the quarter, extending our product capabilities in integrated metrology and technology differentiation to expand our 3D metrology for advanced packaging applications. For operating income of $70 million was 28% of revenue for the third quarter, compared to 27% from the second quarter. We achieved quarter-over-quarter quarter operating margin improvement with three sec consecutive quarters totaling approximately 300 basis point improvement since the start of the year. Our net income performance, also 26% of revenue, was supported from favorable investment income re resulting from our increased cash balance. Now turning to the balance sheet, we ended the second quarter, uh, sorry, we ended the third quarter with cash and short-term investments of 855 million, achieving operating cash flow of 67 million and converting 100% of our operating cash into uh, operating income into cash. Inventory ended the quarter at 308 million, down 12 million versus Q2, and achieving five quarters of sequential decline. We expect further inventory reduction of another eight to 10 million for the fourth quarter as we project. We are holding for the on to innovation. We are just experiencing a brief interruption in today's conference. Please continue to stand by and the conference should resume momentarily. Thank you for your patience. You may you may continue the conference, sir. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, everybody is still on the line, and I will uh, finish my prepared remarks, and we'll go to questions. So, in summary, we're aligned to several diverse end market drivers, and we're well positioned to leverage our portfolio of inspection metrology and software to solve manufacturers' custom our manufacturing customers' high value problems. Through close customer collaborations, we have many exciting new product launches, such as 3D bump metrology, which we recently delivered to a leading memory manufacturer, and void inspection for wafer bonding applications that we expect to ship this year. In addition to the organically developed technology, our recent tuck-ins further enhance our, both our portfolio of synergistic technologies and the markets that we can pursue. Combining the outlook for the end markets we're serving with our new product opportunities, we expect another solid year of growth in 2025. 
And that concludes our prepared remarks. Lisa, please open the call for questions from our covering analysts. Thank you, sir. If you'd like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, star 1 to ask a question. And our first question comes from Brian Chen with Stiefel. Hi there. Um, thanks for letting us ask a, a few questions. Um, and that, also just FYI, Mike, I think where you picked up versus where um, Mark may have left off, I think there might have been a, a break there in terms of some of that content, but um, just FYI. Oh. A- anyways, uh, uh, back, on, back on script here. The, so TSMC effectively ran out of space to expand its co-op footprint this year, but the demand is very high. And so I was kind of curious, what, what do you currently see as timing for when that activity could pick up again? And when you combine that with the visibility you have on gate all around expansion, how confident are you that onto revenue will show further improvement from existing levels moving into first quarter or first half of next year? Good question. Where, where, I'd say, you know, highly confident. We're confident in revenues growing from here as we move into the the first half of next year. Uh, And it's driven by not just gate all around, but we also mentioned DRAM capacity expansions that we're seeing to support uh, both the enterprise server starting to uh, pick up a little bit, but also the lack of capacity due to supporting all of the HBM growth. So we see both, and as far as the TSMC, uh, or sorry, the yeah, well you mentioned TSMC, the COAS expansion, they they have been very aggressive at adding the capacity. We did mention on the prepared remarks that may or may not have made it out there that uh, we expect the fourth quarter to see a, a fairly significant increase, while the yeah, while the HBM maybe is a little more muted in the fourth quarter from an AI packaging perspective. So they're already uh, starting to find space to add capacity, and we expect that to be remain fairly strong in the first half. Okay, got it. And that, that's helpful. And uh, so maybe a little bit earlier customer readiness from that standpoint to take equipment, it sounds like. Um, and then... In terms of that $10 million lithography delay, was that customer driven? Um, any other sort of uh, color behind that? And when has that been rescheduled uh, to? Uh, we're not clear on the reschedule, so that's that's still you know being discussed. But yes, it was 100. It was customer driven based on you know their needs. The tools are ready to go. Okay, got got it. And uh, maybe just a, kind of in one more question uh, in broader strokes. Um, you know, KLA last night on its earnings call, you know, in addition to sort of being pretty upbeat on process control intensity, they're seeing at TSMC as a, that customer shifts from pilot to high volume production. Um, they also expressed a lot of confidence based on the higher process control intensity that, that they would outgrow WFE in, in 2025. Um, and so, when you look at that, again, that high process control intensity, both for gate all around expansions as well as co-ops, advanced packaging, maybe HBM, um, I guess how much confidence do you have in Onto's ability to outgrow WSE again in 2025 like you did uh, in 2024? Well, it depends on what you're expecting WF to be, to be, but if it's in this 5 to 10% range, which is where I think most most of the consensus is, is landing, then we're, we're highly confident in outperforming those numbers um, for the same reasons. And I did talk about increased process control intensity, uh, especially in the area of 2.5D logic or AI packaging, uh, based on the complexity of the process, as well as the, the needs for much better yields. I mean, these are very expensive devices, and you know, any yield issue across any of the products is going to drive a, a pretty expensive loss. So 
so yeah, there's there's a lot of process control intensity, and um, yeah, we're seeing that as well. And they're still learning. So a lot of the the, the capabilities of our Dragonfly with the many different sensors, we see the customers working with us to combine different sensors to find the solutions and metrologies that don't exist today in any other tool. So there's a lot lot of learning that's going on through our collaborations with the customers. Thanks. I'll, I'll uh, appreciate that. I'll requeue for uh, any follow-ups. Thanks. And our next question comes from Vidvati Sharote. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to ask about is last quarter you had talked about, um, you know, volume purchase agreements for gate all around um, um, nodes. I, I think they were roughly 120 million. Can you um, give us an idea or a sense of how how that, you know, Splits out between customers, given that you know some of the leading edge customers are now facing issues with um, with their gate all around transition. So, has your visibility on those VPS changed? Is there any conversation changes where you 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 may not get that whole 120 million? Mm. Not to any major degree, no. Um, in fact, you know, we continue to work off uh, some of that that uh, VPA. There's still quite a bit left for 2025, and and our backlog continues to strengthen and look look relatively good, you know, across the board. So, so no, I would say that yes, there's certainly some movement by some customers, but uh, you know, our position remains remains strong and growing or strengthening i should say is it is it primarily because of um the leading foundry customer being strong is that a way to think about it uh you know that's one but we did mention that 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 uh that the number we talked about were two customers and and both look uh still strong okay uh Understood. So, so now um, maybe on uh, changing tracks on on the HPM kind of a ramp. Um, what's the visibility you have on the HPM capacity additions? Like one one of the things uh, Teradyne pointed out on their call is they're seeing HPM capacity additions could be muted next year, as in the growth for Teradyne's HPM revenues could be muted next year. What is your sense or you know visibility into how how that HPM uh, piece of the business goes into, or, or you know, the trajectory of that business into 2025. Uh, well, that, I, I also mentioned that in my remarks around, you know, we're seeing a uh, quite an increase, a doubling in in capacity from the two and a half D logic side. And last quarter we talked about HBM. Uh, increasing. So that alone would drive an increase, an expected increase in HBM. And then, of course, you have uh, an additional intensity, an additional number of HBM around each each GPU for the new, uh, for the new latest devices. That said, we also uh, see, uh, let's say, we're not seeing movement on HBM expansion yet. And so I, I, I echo that, and that's what I mentioned in the prepared remarks is that, you know, it's not clear yet, but we would expect that some kind of expansion would have to follow to support all of that new 2.5D logic that's coming on board. Uh, my guess is there could be, you know, still some uh, conservatism by the players and and still trying to understand who's going to win what share from let's say the major driver the major end customer and so they're they're careful with the capacity expansions that's my guess but you know i don't know but we are seeing that muted behavior from hbm right now Hi. um that, that's fair um and then the last one i had was on the power semiconductors could you help us understand 
sort of the size of that revenue opportunity for you. And and given that we're, you know, seeing a big downturn in the auto market, but your inspection revenues continue to be strong on the power side, it'd be great if you could um, provide, like, w- what's the disparity there? What what continues to drive your revenues versus, you know, we're seeing CapEx cuts across the board? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it the last couple of quarters. It's all about driving yields and, and higher yields. And I mentioned there's some wafer transitions, whether it's silicon carbide going from 6 to 8 inch or or uh, GAN moving from uh, 8 to 12 inch. That that has an impact on yields and require, uh, sort of creates a requirement for additional process control or, or better process control capabilities. So we're seeing some of that. And then I think it's pretty well publicized that the yields in general are not that high. So customers tend to want to, you know, if they want to increase output or prepare for increased output, and they can focus on yield instead of adding just capacity and throwing away. So that makes them more profitable when they do actually ramp. So how how should we think about the opportunity for you as in kind of the size of the business or any color there would be helpful? Uh, well, we you know we don't break it all down there, but it's becoming, you know, one of our top markets behind AI packaging in the in the specialty and advanced packaging market. So I think it is number two in that in that space. Thank you. I get back in the queue. And we'll move to our next question from Edward Yang with Oppenheimer. Hi Mark. Hi Mike. Hi Mark. Congrats on a great quarter. Uh, just wanted to uh, drill down a little bit deeper into your uh, outlook into 2025. Um, you know, you're expecting continued growth there and outpacing WFE. But you know, obviously this year uh, you gr- you're uh, looking for revenue to grow. You know, about 20 percent, and that's that's well a multiple of how much uh, WFE grew this year. So, uh, thinking about all the different puts and takes. Um, you know what? What are the the things that uh, give you confidence or less confidence? Um, and uh, will you uh, can you size up again? Um, did, are there any reasons why growth should meaningfully accelerate or decelerate from your uh, twenty four run rate? I would say, since I said we grow, uh, <laughs> there'd be a meaningful. Uh, acceleration and that would be in advanced nodes for sure that's been you know bouncing along the bottom and now you know we've talked about gate all around opportunity expansions but we now also are starting to see and gain more confidence in DRAM additional DRAM capacity and growth there uh, driving our advanced nodes so we see that uh, staying you know growing growing quite nicely Uh, the AI packaging uh, for sure gate all around and the process control intensity and volume increases there is creating opportunities. Uh, we'll see what happens with the HBM. Does it stay muted or not? Uh, if not, I think there'll be some significant growth there. I don't see how it could stay as it is if the, you know, if the COAS essentially doubles. So we'll see, uh, but that's, that's that. And then we, we talked about the power semi and, in there, I said we would at least sustain these record levels in the prepared remarks, uh, which which implies we would expect to exceed and set new record levels. So this would be a floor for us, and so that will be another uh, growth driver for us as we look at 2025. And, and just to clarify, when you when you say accelerate, I mean, do you mean accelerate off of a 20% revenue growth rate? Ah, yeah, good point. No, I'm not trying to imply we'd grow above 20%. Um, no, so I should have used the word not accelerate. Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of your larger foundry customers um, signed an advanced packaging deal with an OSAT in uh, Arizona earlier this month. Um, you know, does this have any relevance to your order book and, um 
again, can you uh, speak to the broader ability of your customers to uh, place tools at this point? It seems like things are loosening up a little bit. Uh, is space still a bottleneck? Things are loosening up, so there's new capacity coming up. But even signing that deal, there's there's uh, timelines to transfer and to qualify and to bring in tools, et cetera, which some of it's 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 in process. So, but there's not an immediate like a uh, launch, right? So, so yes, it's all part of the mm, breaking of the current bottlenecks in the co-op capacity. There's also uh, you know, actions being taken by that that large customer as well internally, and and there's been discussions about the Intellex purchase, um, and I might prepared remarks. I did mention Q4. We see a nice big uptick from the gate all around. Uh, sorry for the for the um, two and a half D logic packaging, and we expect uh, that to maintain pretty healthy in the first half. Uh, and just a final question, maybe from uh, Mark. I saw the SGNA ticked up a little bit sequentially, and um, you know, is that a good run rate going forward, or was was there um, any any extra spending in there that impacted the quarter? Yeah, I mean, I I would think our goal is to hold total opex, you know, in line or better than Q3. Um, so I'd use I'd use that run rate from Q3 into Q4. Um, in my prepared remarks, which might have been uh, abbreviated, um, you know, our goal is to, you know, drive offsets to the the cost of the tuck-ins within Q4. Um, so we we can our goal is to stay at at those levels for uh, Q4 or better. Thank you. Thanks. And we'll do, move to our next question from Mayor Popery from B Riley Securities. <laughs> Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm actually on for Craig Ellis. Um, but you mentioned uh, packaging pickup in uh, the fourth quarter. Um, is that kind of related to the increased complexity needs as we move into this RDL-based uh, packaging? Uh, or is it more to do with uh, just general volume increases? And if it's to do with this um, LDL, RDL-based packaging increase, is that a trend that we can expect to continue as RDL picks up over the incumbents? I think that the complexity increases is from two things, uh, a couple things. One is, yes, they're introducing some some new processes that they've talked about. Uh, but two is yields haven't been, you know, yields have room to improve. So they're also looking at areas that could be impacting yield and how can they measure. So you can't fix what you can't see. So how can we see, help them see what what is impacting yield so then they can make the adjustments and fix it. And that's, that's a, that dynamic is also in play. And that's where I mentioned, you know, the, the incredible breadth of capability we have on the Dragonfly platform to bring to bear different types of sensors and metrologies and inspection in order to combine that data and, and see things that you wouldn't see on any single tool. So that provides new insights in, into the yield opportunities to improve. Okay, yeah, right. No, that's that's a great answer. Um, so I have a question on the flies, you know, the Dragonfly and the Firefly. Um, obviously, they're they're really capable tools in the in 2D metrology, um, but you've also pointed out before how they're incredibly capable in the 3D inspection space. Um, do you see that kind of picking up share? I know you mentioned one memory customer who wanted it uh, for these um, 3D inspection processes. Do you see that 3D inspection aspect to these to these tools picking up? So there's there's localized 3D capability, which is very powerful, and we use that for you know high aspect ratio 3D, very high precision metrology. That that is part of the the 2D applications. What I was talking about was 3D bump metrology, and and that's that's early that's still early stages so it's too soon to predict um you know how big or how how much that could be it depends on adoption rate and how well we do in production the tool we shipped is an evaluation tool so they'll they'll now based on the data exchanges we've had and all the wafers we've run for them in our facility they now want to take the tool on site 
prove it in production, and then hopefully we start to see revenue. And that that's probably a, you know three to six to nine month on the outside type process. All right, gotcha. And that's uh yeah. I hope that goes well. Um, and then about those volume yep. purchases. And we expect. We sorry, uh, we do. I was going to say we do expect to ship addition, additional tools uh, in the fourth quarter to additional customers for evaluation. And that's evaluation on 3D? Yep. Okay, great, great. Um, and again, about those uh, volume purchase agreements, um, so, you know, we were talking about last quarter. Um, I, I forgot exactly who asked this question, but, you know, there was some talk about how these might convert into um, kind of uh, larger agreements in the future. Um, is there any progress there on in terms of kind of converting these uh, initial agreements into perhaps larger uh, partnerships going forward? Mm, I think what I might have said is that we would expect perhaps additional revenue through the year. And right now they're still working on this. So, you know, I think it will, will it, it, um, they got to cut through this and then we'll see what happens in the second half of the year. But that's still my, my projection. I, I wouldn't, if I was going to bias it, I'd bias it towards they're going to need some additional tools in the second half versus, um, versus not. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Um, thanks for talking to me. Yep. My pleasure. And our next question comes from Charles Chi with Needham. Hey, um, um, so uh, you guys got to cut off um, the big chunk of the prepare remarks uh, we actually didn't hear. Um, so maybe, Mark, can you kind of repeat what the Q4 guidance, uh, line by line, uh, well, what's in your prepare remarks? Because I, I think it's kind of important that if you can repeat for us, that would be great. Hopefully, this doesn't count as a question. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah, so I mean, I'll just start out, at, uh, Charles. I'll just start out at uh, to, at inventory. So inventory ended the quarter at 308 million, down 12 million versus Q2, and achieving five quarters of essential decline, sequential decline. We expect further inventory reduction of another eight to 10 million for the fourth quarter, as we uh, project to be below 300 million as we exit 2024 which will be a 50 million reduction from our peak of 2023 inventory levels. As we look at the fourth quarter, we currently expect revenue uh, for the fourth quarter to be between 253 and 267 million. We expect gross margins will be 54 to 55%. With our inventory still above our target level, this is delaying our ability to cut in these supply chain cost reductions as we continue to prioritize the burn down of existing component levels. For operating expenses, we expect to be between 66 to 68 million as we look to hold OPEX flat or better versus Q3 as we optimize R&D to minimize the cost impact of the tuck-ins we announced earlier. For the fourth quarter, we expect our effective tax rate to be between 15 to 16 percent. We expect our diluted share count for the fourth quarter to be approximately 49.8 million shares. Based upon these assumptions, we anticipate our non-GAAP earnings for the fourth quarter to be between $1.33 and $1.48 per share. So, Charles, you can ask your real question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I, I'm trying to connect the dots here, uh, uh, Mike. The, the, over the last quarter, the, let's say three months, uh, two out of the, let's say, for leading edge customers you you have uh, have had a pretty tough um, um, uh, i mean a, a news coverage um their struggles on um and uh, the, the potential pressure on tax but uh we know that uh, your lethal uh, which uh, unfortunately has been a, a quite a quite often a downside contributor to your quarterly earnings uh for for the past uh, one year one and a half um, um, has a lot of uh, sales tied into those uh, two customers. Uh, am I connecting the dots right here? Because because I, I I would be thinking maybe some of the push out or maybe it looks sounds like it's more like a in, 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 I mean it, it's it's the delayed to an unknown date. Uh, it's really tied to these two customers. Is that uh, anything to do with uh, with the the, the capex uh, uh, cut that they that they could be uh, they could be going through? So 
So I don't know which two customers particularly you have in mind. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, I think if you look at the substrate market where this where the lithography tool plays, there was massive, let's say, um, bottlenecks that several of the enterprise server customers, manufacturers, complained about publicly that you know they were supply constrained by lack of substrates. And so there was a really, really aggressive expansion through 2022, maybe a little bit into 2023. And then, as we all know, the markets really softened, especially for enterprise high performance compute. And so, and you know, NVIDIA's the you know the AI is the big big engine now, and that's on a wafer basis. So that capacity, that excess capacity, is starting to be uh, picked up, and we see a little bit of pickup, but it's still off of a kind of a low base. And you can see that reflected. In the end, in the comments I made about DRAM and and the strength we're seeing now in DRAM, and that's driven by some of the enterprise or hyperscalers and some enterprise compute, uh, you know, warming up. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but uh, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, it sounds like you think the the push out is probably more of the cyclical factor at play rather than anything that's a structural. I mean, that that those two customers are probably having more of a structural problem than the cyclical problem. That that was what what I'm trying to to figure out. Uh, yeah, I think so, it's more. Uh, yep. Good. Yeah. So the the other thing I I I, I do want to uh, 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 talk uh, talk to you about uh, really is the AI packaging business. I think uh, last quarter you talk about maybe second half this year, uh, roughly ten percent below the first half level, combining two point five D and the HBM. And uh, uh, based on what you said, it sounds like in Q three HBM was okay. 2.5D was down a bit, Q4, uh, uh, 2.5D coming back up, but the HBM a little bit more muted. But do you still view that uh, minus 10%, half over half, the right number? Is it? Uh, is there any upside or downside to that number so far based on what you see? Yeah, that's a good question. It was in my prepared remarks, which of course no one seemed to have heard, but uh, <laughs> it was. I did say that it's cut in half. So things have you know, if if I had said uh, five to ten percent, it's about half of that now, as far as the down goes. It's about half so the decline that we we originally projected. Okay, okay, okay. It's roughly five percent down compared with the first half level, and and, uh, and yep. the first half twenty five. Because uh, because oh, uh, allow me to uh, finish this question. Um, you you, you kind of said that you you expect that they will be higher than second half twenty four level, uh, based on the order intake, based on the customer indications. Do you do you still feel like uh, that's about the right, like a uh, first half twenty five higher than second half twenty four, but uh, but uh, still have to wait and see if it can exceed the first half twenty four level. This is for AI packaging specifically? AI packaging, yes. Uh, yeah, I think for for logic, it's going to be uh, relatively healthy. Uh, so maybe at the same level, I'd have to double check. But the real question mark is the HBM piece. As as we mentioned, we see that muted right now. Though, when we look at the expansion on the on the um, two and a half D logic side, it's hard not to expect expansion on HBM to keep up. Got it. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome, Charles. And our next question comes from Mark Miller with the Benchmark Company. Uh, congrats on your another good quarter. I was just wondering, give us a feeling for what you're expecting in China next, in China and Korea next year. Uh, 
Well, Korea, we can say I mentioned the DRAM and the DRAM growth, so you could guess that Korea would participate in that. <laughs> uh, China, we expect, I mean, we're already relatively de-risked in China, so, you know, we, we're around the 12, 10 to 15 percent range, and I would expect to be in that same range, maybe. Yeah, I would expect to be in that same range. So 10 to 15 percent of sales from China next year. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. And our next question comes from David Dooley with Steelhead Securities. <clears throat> yes, thanks for taking my question. My my first question is on the NAND market. Um, you know, your big Korean HBM customer also plays in that market. I think they were talking about their, you know, their SSD business being up uh, 20% sequentially and 430% year over year. Lamb's talking about a big upgrade cycle, you know, to move up in the number of layers. So we're not seeing wafer, you know, new wafer starts added, but we're seeing a big upgrade cycle. And I was just wondering how you might participate in that. We see NAND uh, growing for us in 2025, and on a percentage basis, it would look very impressive, but it's still off of a very small base. So we don't see NAND uh, recovering. So it's probably, as we mentioned a couple, I think now two quarters ago, it's really the, the high-level, high-stack NAND to support AI uh, devices and AI server farms, the, the high-speed data. So that's you know that that's essentially what we see as far as you know the high stack and then you know the more layers mean a lot more of our um, process control not as much so the the capital intensity will there there'll be a couple of extra steps in there and that's where the aspect uh, metrology comes into play but we don't see any you know massive increases in let's say our OCD. Uh, metrology uh, as a result. Okay, and my second question is kind of around the high bandwidth memory market. Um, I realize, you know, your customers aren't giving you a lot of visibility, I guess, into when they might expand the capacity. But, you know, when you think about, I think you've highlighted this, the number of chips per GPU is probably going to double uh, with Blackwell versus Hopper. You got them stack it going from stacking eight to twelve, um, and you also have Micron ramping up. And you know, I think Samsung just announced yesterday or the day before that they're close to signing their agreement with Nvidia as well. So, I'm kind of curious why you wouldn't be much more positive about the growth in that in market, given all the unit volume growth and more customers coming online. And is there? But well, anyway, just maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. <laughs> what what makes me positive is orders. <laughs> so I see all the activity and I and I like, you know, our position and we we're you know trying to expand our position with the with the the work we're doing on the 3D metrology, so going going after more let's say wallet share, but um you know, we're we're not seeing the orders yet and as I mentioned I think earlier that there's there's some conservatism with these customers. If everyone's ramping and qualified, they may not know yet what share they're going to have and how much they want to expand in order to serve that share. I'm sure NVIDIA is working them all against each other. So I don't know if I, you know, that's just a guess. But um, yeah, when I start seeing orders, I'll get a lot more confident. What I, What we can do is look at the model and say, hey, the capacity we see is not matching the demand that that two and a half D upgrade or, or expansion is going to need. So something has to give. And you keep highlighting how all the co op capacity expansion should mean that HBM capacity expands. I think I understand what you're saying, but could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, if 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 the markets were at perfect equilibrium and we're going to double the two and a half D logics uh, side, and we're saying that for each two and a half D logic, the amount of HBM around it is going to increase, let's say a factor of two, like the number you use. Now that's a four X increase in 
in uh, D or HBM that that would be required. That's just if everything was in equilibrium. So now you have to say, okay, well, some capacity was added. Not everybody got cut into, you know, to let's say the NVIDIA supply chain early on. So who's going to win? How much excess capacity is there? I mean, we try and model this out. But to us, no matter how we look at this, it looks like some capacity expansion is going to be required. Yes. Okay. And uh, two final questions. Um, what are your lead times for your HBM inspection tools? And the second question is, a lot of this co-op capacity that's going to come online is not necessarily going to come online at TSMC. If you listen to ASE, they're ramping up as fast as they can um, as TSMC's partner to expand co-op. And, you know, there's another question earlier about Amcor, but that's a couple years out, I would think. But do you benefit from capacity expansions at the Taiwanese OSATs the same degree that you would benefit from capacity expansions at TSMC for 2.5D packaging? If they run the exact same process, then then yes. Um, we're, that's, that's yet to be determined. Uh, so we are benefiting. We are seeing engagement. We are getting orders. Uh, obviously, not to the same degree right now as the leader uh, that you mentioned, uh, but um, you know they're also nowhere near. I mean, they're not even ramping yet, right? They're just they're just starting to ramp. So I would say that remains to be seen. But again, yields are yields. It's hard to believe anyone's going to have better yields or better process than TSMC. So my guess is we'd yeah. see at least an equivalent. Capital, uh, process control intensity. Okay, thank you. Oh, and the lead time. Uh, lead time. Well, I was not going to answer that anyway, but <laughs> uh, I would say we're looking <laughs> at mind. three three months <laughs> or so. You know, it's 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 definitely increasing. The volume's gone way up, but as you know, we we've we've always mentioned we build to a forecast to the extent we have a good forecast data. You know, we we. We can adjust lead times, but um, things are ticking out a little bit because of the such strong demand we have right now. So with that kind of short lead time, obviously, if a customer came in and won a bunch of, of tools, you have the capacity to meet that order. Yeah, we work hard to make sure we do. I mean, no one expected us to have to double the capacity output for you know, dragonflies this year, and yet that's that's essentially what we've done. So, um, yeah, we we're the teams are outstanding at getting creative, reducing cycle times, leveraging our supply chain partners, and making sure we serve our customers. And as we've commented before, we have the capacity within our manufacturing to do that. Excellent, you guys. Um, uh, we appreciate the excellent execution. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. And we'll take our last question in queue from Brian Chen with Stiefel. Hi there. Um, you know, uh, it wasn't really a question, but what I was going to suggest or maybe just put out there is that um, I appreciate Mark repeating the complete fourth quarter guidance. And I, I was going to ask, Mike, if you had – uh, substantive commentary after Mark's uh, guidance. Uh, I think we missed pretty much all that. So if there was something there, it might be worth repeating. If not, then, you know, no bother. But I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, sure. I can, uh, yeah, Brian, we're we're just aligning to where on the his prepared remarks was cut to where he picked up. This one. Okay, so essentially... I, uh, I had said that demand for process control and AI packaging gate all around power semiconductors remains quite strong. Uh, specifically with AI packaging, we see improvements over our prior second half 2024 projections. And this I've already mentioned, so that I'll skip. Uh, and I mentioned that's helping to offset that, that added growth in the uh, AI packaging is offsetting the 10 million pushout that we had expected from the lithography. So, in fact, we would have been a significant beat. 
Uh, and then I mentioned that the market leader in the AI logic packaging recently announced a doubling of 2.5D logic capacity for next year. Though not yet certain, we would expect to see orders for supporting HBM memory to also improve to support this growth in logic. Again, something we discussed. Uh, and I mentioned that the growth in high bandwidth memory has taken a meaningful amount of capacity away from standard DRAM, as HBM requires roughly three times more wafer capacity. And this, in turn, is contributing to an expansion and advanced DRAM to support a recovery in enterprise servers and investments by hyperscale customers, which, which we expect to see or benefit from more meaningfully in the first half of 2025. Uh, yeah, I think that's the essential message. I tried to bring that all in when I answered some of the questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think you were able to, to incorporate some of that. No, I, I appreciate that. Maybe just maybe one last question against that. I, I know you, you don't dictate your customers uh, intake and demand and shipment timing, but to the extent that you kind of can have some, some uh, you know, uh, I guess modulation here where kind of one customer is bigger, another customer maybe subsides for a quarter or two or wh whatever the case is, um, I guess that alleviates sort of your manufacturing, upward pressure on your manufacturing footprint. To the extent you may have HBM stronger in the same period that COAS is strong, yeah, do you have that ability to flex upwards in terms of higher output in manufacturing? Yeah, we absolutely do. I mean, we're not even running full second shifts, let alone third shifts. So that alone, if we made no other improvements, would allow us to significantly increase capacity. So we absolutely do. There's other things we're working on. I mentioned uh, working with supply chain partners, so we're we're – Let's moving some of the less skilled or, or um, you know, more some of the sub assemblies to partners uh, where we can take that off and free up the floor and free up our our higher trained technical people. So uh, to focus on the more difficult integration. So yeah, we we definitely have the ability to serve the customers and and their needs as they grow. Yeah, and maybe just to clarify one comment you made, I think you said backlog continues to strengthen, so it sounds like you're running a positive book to bill with orders ahead of of revenue across the business. Well, we don't. I, I don't have it exactly in front of me. I just mentioned the backlog has strengthened, so you know we don't really report on it. But I knew people would be concerned around or or asking about the VPA and what does that mean? How's that being worked down? And in fact, you know we we continue to to grow our backlog even as we work through that VPA. So to me, that was a comment just to indicate we still see strong demand and not much softening at least in the areas we're focused on right now. And, and I imagine even, you know, the fact that you have that VPA and HBM is a portion of that, I guess that does give you some some comfort that some of that activity is still um, you know, on the come next year. Yeah, for sure. I didn't say it would go to zero. <laughs> HBM is still going to be there. I just think it could be even stronger based on the, you know, the demand supply models we have between the the two and a half D logic and the HBM. So okay. hopefully no, there's some upside sense. we can talk about in future quarter. Yep. Appreciate that. Thank you. And Welcome. ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's Q and A session. I'd like now to turn the call back to Sydney Ho for any additional or closing remarks. Thank you. Um, we will be participating in a number of investor conferences throughout this quarter. We look forward to seeing many of you there. A replay of the call today will be available on our website at approximately 7.30 Eastern time this evening. We'd like to thank you for your continual interest in onto innovation. Lisa, please conclude the call. And ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. Thank you for your patience and your participation. You may now disconnect.